Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to DBA Fundamentals Down Under for the month of April. Once again, I'm your host, Warwick Rudd. This, year, this month, we've got uh, Hamish Watson talking to us about test-driven development in SQL Server. It will make your database deployments better. Now, before I hand over to Hamish, I do have some housekeeping that uh, I will quickly run through. So first off, for those of you who may or may not be aware, Pass Summit 2018 uh, is back in Seattle in November. The call for speakers has closed, so we should be hearing all of the uh, sessions that will be going on uh, over the next couple of months. If you haven't already registered, make sure you register for this uh, three and a bit days of training. It's very worth your while. Like last month, we're now promoting past Facebook Live. And uh, in the next upcoming session, we've got uh, Paul Turley talking to us about, or oh, it hasn't got his content, but that's okay. Make sure that you register to uh, listen to Paul Turley in the upcoming session in 14 days time. If you haven't already uh, put yourself out there as a past volunteer, make sure that you do. And you can go in the running to get a $100 gift card for any referrals for uh, community sponsors. Past Career Centre, if you want to uh, a change of positions, feel free to have a look at PASS and uh, have a look at the careers that they do have available and you can be a part of this fantastic SQL community. Make sure that apart from this virtual chapter, there are many other virtual chapters that you can register and participate with to help grow your career and learn from some fantastic presenters globally. Make sure that you stay connected. You can look at the pass.org website on Twitter, stay focused with the hashtag SQL Pass or the at SQL Pass Twitter handle. Now, I just want to promote some upcoming SQL Saturday events in our area. We've got SQL Saturday 712 in South Island uh, on Saturday the 26th of May. Speaker submissions are still open, or actually they close, well, obviously with the time zones, they uh, close tomorrow. Make sure that uh, you register. If you want to be a speaker, there's still time. Following the weekend after that, we've got SQL Saturday 713 here in Brisbane. We've already closed the speaker, uh, the call for speakers, and we will be announcing those over the coming week. For SQL Saturday Brisbane, we are running two pre-conferences. The first one is on machine learning with SQL Server by Ginger Grant. If you wish to learn about uh, machine learning, feel free to go to the Eventbrite site register for this fantastic one day of training. The second pre-con that we've got is SQL Server Practical Performance Troubleshooting. And this is by Amit Bansal. If you would like to learn about performance tuning from Amit, once again, we can go to the Eventbrite site, register for this fantastic day of learning. If you're into Power BI, there is a two-day Power BI training course by uh, Ginger to take you from start to finish with Power BI. With that, I'll now hand over to Hamish for today's session. Thank you, Warwick. All right, just uh, get everything up and running. Alrighty, hopefully you can see my screen. Okay, uh, welcome to Test Driven Development in SQL Server. It will make your database deployments better. My name is Hamish Watson. I'm from Christchurch, New Zealand, and I've been working in IT for 7,078 days. So obviously started when I was a child. Um, been managing SQL Server since SQL Server 2000. Uh, I'm a DevOps alchemist. I may have made that title up. Um, in my real job, I'm a DevOps consultant for SQL Masters Consulting. Um, I like to speak, as you can see there. Um, the reason I like to speak is because my whole life is a unit test, and I've made so many mistakes, and I want to help people learn from my mistakes. I've been recognized by the community. I'm one of only six uh, Microsoft Data Platform MVPs in New Zealand, and I like this thing called DevOps, which is part of what today's discussion is about. 
Um, my hashtag on Twitter is make stuff go. Um, and I write a blog at hybriddbablog.com. And my community email for people who want to reach out and ask me questions is there hamish at morfit.co.nz. Right, what are we going to do today? Um, I'm going to talk about test driven development and why should people, as either a database administrator or a database developer, even care about this? I'm going to talk about the tools that will allow us to achieve quality code and changes to our database. And I'm going to uh, showcase a demo, which hopefully will take you from someone who either doesn't understand or doesn't like test-driven development to someone who loves it. I'm also going to talk about the lessons I've learned uh, with test-driven development. Test-driven testing in general is kind of like this. We have a developer on the left-hand side, a tester on the right-hand side, and they're both looking at the same thing, but seeing far different things. Compounding this is so many systems are considered legacy code, i.e. they can't have unit tests put on them, when in fact they can. And I actually think the legacy code is simply code that doesn't have tests. And in my uh, involvement with DevOps is testing is the one thing in DevOps that always gets missed out, and especially in the database. So what is test-driven development? Martin Fowler, back in 2005, came up with a definition of it where it's a technique for building software that guides software development by writing tests. And some people think, well, that's, you know, 13 years ago. That's um, been around for a while. Well, in fact, it's even earlier than that. It was developed in the 1990s as part of extreme programming by Kent Beck. And it revolves around where the requirements for a system are defined in agile processes, and those requirements are then turned into specific test cases before we develop. And the software that we're creating, we create and we improve to pass the tests that have been um, defined in our user case. Wait, did I just say the word agile? I did. I said that the requirements are defined in agile process are then turned into specific test cases. And this really is that session that reminds us that as data professionals, we're dealing with systems developed using agile principles. You know, developers have been using agile for decades. And we as data professionals have to play catch up. Agile is really about where we have the highest priority to satisfy the client through early and continuous delivery of value. And it's important to think about the client because they pay us. Without the client, we're not getting money. So however we can increase the user experience or client experience to be um, better, it's got to be a good thing because they're hopefully going to pay us more. Agile processes harness change for competitive advantage. It means that we can react and adapt far quicker to the client than anyone else can. It also means that we're delivering working software frequently with a preference for shorter timescale, i.e. small iterative changes that we're delivering out far quicker. <laughs> and working software, this is the primary measure of our progress because we want our code in a deployable state at all times. And the promotion of sustainable development, this allows us to maintain a constant pace and in Agile development, design is supposed to be built gradually as per the need. But if your software is huge and complex, you may never have the confidence to build as per that need, unless, of course, you're using test-driven development. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, this is the old school approach. And in fact, I've been thinking about this diagram and, and replacing it just with a shoe, because I see the old school approach to development like buying a shoe on the internet. It's like, I see a shoe on the internet and I buy it. I get it home and it doesn't fit. And it's like, why doesn't it fit? Because I tested when it got to my house. I'm a size 10 and a half shoe and I bought a size seven. And the only way I found out was when it turned up at my house. So I designed, coded and then tested. Whereas in fact, I should have done the new school approach where I design, i.e. I want a shoe, I test, how big is my foot? And then I code, 
pay by the shoe. And so this is turning around from the old school approach where we're testing right at the end to the new school approach where we're testing right after we design, I when we understand what the user or client wants. So again, what is test-driven development? We basically write a test for the next bit of functionality that we want to add to the system. We write the functional code until the test passes. We then refactor with confidence both new and old code to make it well structured. And we, keep continu we continue cycling through these three steps, one test at a time, building up the functionality of the system. This is the life cycle of test-driven development. And I thought I'd use this cool little diagram. So we write the test first. And in test-driven development, each new feature begins with writing a test. We write the test that defines a function or improvement of a function, which obviously should be very succinct. We then run a test and obviously we check to see if the test fails and we actually want it to fail because we want to find out any false positives. Um, and the differenti differentiating factor of test-driven development versus writing unit tests after the code is that it makes the developer focus on the requirements before even writing the code. So many times I see developers worrying about tabs versus spaces or how eloquent elegant rather, their code looks, rather than understanding the use case. So we check if the test fails, and then we write enough code to pass the test. And then we actually go back and rewrite the test. We check to see if it passes, and again, write enough code. But this is only half of, um, half of the story because now we want to actually go back and refactor. So if the test succeeds, we now check if all tests pass, i.e. succeed. And if all test cases now pass, the developer can be confident that the new code meets the test requirements and does not break or degrade any existing features. If they do not, the new code must be adjusted until they do. And the growing code base must be um, Cleaned up regularly during test driven development, new, co new code can be moved from where it was convenient for passing a test to where it actually more logically belongs. And as you can see here, we're continuously refactoring, making sure our tests pass, and we repeat. So starting with another test, the cycle is repeated to push forward the functionality. The size of the step should always be small, with as as few as say one to 10 edits between each test run. If new code does not rapidly satisfy a new test or other tests fail unexpectedly, the developer should undo or not make increment or should undo or revert in preference to, um, uh, sorry, rather than doing excessive debugging. One of the principles that ties into test-driven development is continuous integration. And it helps us by providing revertible checkpoints, i.e. as we commit our code into source control, we do the builds, do the tests. If they fail, we stop, remediate. So why do people love test-driven development? I always like to have a cartoon. And one of the ones, one of the reasons is around improved quality. I automated tests reduce the number of defects. And part of the principles of test-driven development is that we want to automate our tests. We also want to increase the agility. Having existing automated tests allows teams to respond more quickly to changing requirements, i.e. that good old agile word again. And it reduces our risk. Having a, having a suite of automated tests reduces the risks when making changes to the code. And it helps teams to respond, again, more quickly to change. It also instills confidence because developers have confidence they aren't breaking anything when changing existing code. It also results in cleaner code. Having to design the code for testing results in smaller modular and loosely coupled components. So on the flip side, 
why do people hate test-driven development? Test-driven development for databases is hard. <laughs> and that is actually, that is correct. And it's more the reason to do it because doing test-driven development for application development is, is a lot easier because databases have persistent data. And if we do something wrong in an application, we just roll back the DLLs. Doing that with a database is a far, far different story. Asking a client if we can restore their database for 20 hours, uh, generally they don't like that. And it does not mean that we have to learn another language because the tools can help. There are open source tools like T SQL T. There are utilities like SQL Test. And there's also SQL Server, SQL Server data tools that allow us to write unit tests in T SQL. So DBAs are writing in a language they're used to. <laughs> and slow. It's true that you'll spend more time on upfront design and development, but the key point is you'll spend a lot less time debugging in the long run. No production code is written because the code you'll write is to pass tests, and those tests will be driven by established requirements. And it's far easier to do small modular changes than doing a whole raft of development and then doing the testing at the end. <laughs> Reference data. The cool thing is some of the utilities out there like T-SQL T allow us to set up reference data. And it can be stored in source control and pulled down with the project and put into our automated deploy processes and automated build processes. <laughs> Writing tests for all legacy code. Look, I do agree. We don't have to write hundreds of regression tests, but when a bug is identified in that code or you're changing that code to support a new feature, we should write the unit test. So we're backfitting um, unit testing and test back to that legacy code. Working software is a primary measure of success. And in my opinion, unit tests will help us achieve that via test-driven development. And again, lack of knowledge or experience in test-first development. That's part of the reason why I'm doing this session, because I have seen for so long uh, people trying to um, do test-driven development or not understanding it. And uh, by doing these sessions, it allows me to help people understand what test-driven development's about. Why should DBAs or database care? Things have been changing in software development life cycle. You know, how many people have their database and source control? Probably not many at all. In the last 20 years, Agile and DevOps continuous delivery have changed the playing field for us. We have a small piece of work that we need to get out quickly. And for web apps, that's easy because, again, if something goes wrong, <laughs> we just replace the DLLs. Databases are far harder to deploy than web apps. Source control is even harder for databases. And one of the key things that I do um, in my sessions and with uh, clients is introducing them to the um, ability to put their database into source control. We want to, we care about the data and we care about the end state of that data. By putting our database in source control, we're going to automate the deployment of our databases through our environments. It means that we can also make a change to one place in our database and see what effect that, ha that does. The number of times where I'm working with people and a developer will make one change here, developer over here makes a change, and suddenly, you know, this change here is affecting that developer there, but we don't know. By having tests before each release, we want to test every use case with every parameter. And part of that is making use of automation. Because one of the things 
we want to do is deploy far more frequently. And the only way we can do that is automate as much as we can. The only problem is, is that by doing so many more frequent deploys, thanks to DevOps, <laughs> we're now shipping more bugs to prod faster than we ever have before. Test-driven development relies on unit tests. Unit tests, uh, the primary goal of unit tests is to make to take the smallest piece of testable software in the application, isolate it from the remainder of the code. Oh, my screen has gone dead. Uh, the smallest piece of testable software in the application, isolate it from the remainder of the code and determine whether it behaves as you expect it would. Don't pout. So what is pout? This is plain old unit testing. We want to write the unit test first. And we always test the failures first. This means we can eliminate false positives. We test small code pieces or individual functions so that the errors raised are independent and do not impact the other test cases, i.e. our tests are self-encapsulated. We then combine them with integration and functional testing early on in our continuous delivery pipeline. This is part of the shift left process that you may see um, described around deploying to applications. We also need to test our data. Test-driven development will not result in completely bug-free code because um, <clears throat> part of this is that we're human, so we still need to do test, user acceptance tests, because quite often users will use the system in a different way to what we thought they would in the use case. And data is hard, which is even more reason to do the testing. And so often I talk to database professionals and ask, do you do unit tests? They say no. Yet I ask them, would you ever hire a .NET developer who didn't test their code? This seems unthinkable. A developer may write tests for all the use cases they think about, but again, as mentioned, when the application goes into UA to production, other edge cases may emerge that will highlight new bugs. And so this is more reason to test with our databases. The tests need to be repeatable, automated, and of various kinds. We want to do their unit tests. We want to feed that into integration, logical, functional tests. We want our QA engineers running across it. And again, that user testing. And we want immediate feedback. And we can then test for our mistakes so we don't repeat. The reason we do this is because if we make a mistake in our system, we then want to write the test so that that mistake is not repeated. Test-driven development is not integration testing, nor is it about system functional or load testing or user acceptance testing or any other type of testing other than low level unit testing. So we do it right at the beginning. I wanna quickly just talk about continuous delivery principles. We wanna build the quality in, i.e. unit testing, because it's much cheaper to fix problems and defects if we find them immediately. Ideally, before they're ever checked into version control by running automated tests locally. Finding defects further down in our deployment strategy through inspection, i.e. manual testing, is time consuming, which requires significant triage. And I always describe to developers and DBAs, how about if you find the defect in your code at three o'clock in the afternoon on your laptop. You're the only person that then knows that that bug is there, you can fix it. Whereas if you do not do unit testing right at the beginning, or do test-driven development, and that bug finds its way to production, at three in the morning, there are gonna be a lot more people finding out about your bug. And you're probably gonna to have to be awake at three in the morning. Continuous delivery also, um, has the concept of working in small batches. And in traditional based uh, phased approaches to software development or database development as well, handoffs from dev to test, 
or test IT operation consisted of whole releases, i.e. months work, worth of work by teams. Whereas in continuous delivery, we take the opposite approach and try and get every change in version control as far as towards release as we can. And we want to get comprehensive feedback as rapidly as possible. And working in small batches has many benefits. It reduces the time it takes to get feedback on our work, which means it's easier to triage and remediate those problems. We want the computers to do the repetitive tasks, the mind-numbingly jobs, you know, like deploying at three in the morning, whereas people are far better at solving problems. And many people worry that automation will put them out of a job. This is not the goal. There'll actually never be shortage of work in a successful company. Rather, people are freed up from the mindless drudge work to focus on higher value activities. It also has the benefit of improving quality since humans are at their most error prone when performing mindless tasks. It also means that instead of having a team of people doing deploys at three in the morning, not only will those people be at work the next day, but we could put them onto high value activities, i.e., learning how to tune indexes and then tuning indexes, because I've never met a database that doesn't require any form of tuning. And we want to relentlessly pursue continuous improvement. The reason why we do this is as we chip away at <clears throat> our database systems and our applications, there's always going to be more things that we want to add and change because our landscape is is forever changing. So we want to keep our eye on the goal of quality deploys to our end systems. Everyone is responsible. In high performing organizations, nothing is somebody else's problem. Developers are responsible for the quality and stability of the software they build. Operation teams are responsible for helping the developers build quality in. And everyone works together to achieve the organizational level goals rather than optimizing for what's best for their team or department. And it helps us to achieve database lifecycle management. This is basically where we're bringing DevOps to the database. So what I have here is a diagram that showcases continuous delivery. And what we have is developers on the left who are doing test-driven development via unit testing. They're then pushing that though the code up to a build server, which then runs build tests. We then immediately deploy to a continuous integration or build environment, and we're getting feedback. The thing here is the CI and build environment are prod-like. What I mean by prod-like is our production database might be one terabyte in size, but the CI and build environments might only be, say, 50 megabytes in size, but they are the same schema, the same structure, set up everything as what production will be. This means that our application and database are tested in an environment close to the prod environment the app and database code will be delivered to. And it enables operations to see early in the cycle how environments will behave supporting the app. It means that we've finally, we have finely tuned app aware environments. And if it passes in CI and build, we'll then deploy out to integration, functional, and UAT. And we're doing continuous testing the whole way along. And we're getting feedback the whole way along. And if, let's say, something breaks in the functional uh, environment, we stop, we remediate, we then push through our deployment lifecycle right through. And once it passes functional, we will then deploy it into UAT. And then once it's succeeded in UAT, we'll then push to pre-prod and finally prod. And we're doing continuous monitoring the whole way along. Continuous monitoring allows us to scrutinize the performance of the system, the database, the applications, everything along the way. And the cool thing is, because these systems don't have to be as big as prod, but they have to be prod-like, we can make use of the cloud. We can use Azure, Amazon Web Services, whatever, to host some of the databases and applications. And even better, by having this immediate feedback, it means that we get early warning of operational and quality issues. 
it means that we can, again, remediate far quicker. Right, I want to talk about some of the testing frameworks. And one of them is SQL Server Data Tools. Um, it's a unit test frame. SSDT has a unit test framework in it, which was added to uh, SSDT in December 2012. Uh, there's a link here that you can go to to um, look at what's involved in using SSDT uh, for unit tests. And it allows us to write native T SQL for the code for those tests. And it can be run locally and as part of continuous integration build verification process, i.e. automated builds, automated testing. One of the testing frameworks that I really like is T-SQL T. The reason why I do like it is it's open source, <laughs> which means that it's free. And it's a database unit testing framework, and it's available at tsqlt.org. And what it does, it allows us to write unit tests in T-SQL and run them directly in SQL Server. Now, it does rely CLR to be turned on. So what we would do is do this in our development systems. We wouldn't be doing this in prod. And it makes use of fake tables and views, means that code can be isolated while testing. Fake tables is the equivalent of mocking, which application developers are used to. And it allows us to take a copy of the table as it is and test against it. I, we're not actually affecting the table itself, we're mocking it up. The output is in plain text or XML, and we can integrate it with a uh, continuous integration tool. It also supports the J unit test output format, as some application developers are used to. And tests are grouped in their own schema. This means we can organize our tests and use common setup methods. T-SQL 2 is used by Redgate and DBForge unit tests as part of uh, their suite of uh, test frameworks. And it adheres to the three A's of unit testing. We have the arrange or assemble phase. And this is where we do any setup for the running of the test, including mocking up our objects. We then have the act phase, which is where the function is actually executed, i.e. we're putting the system under test. We then have the assert phase, where the result from the act stage is compared to the expectation, i.e. did the test do what we we're expecting it to. Oh, <laughs> um, and tests are automatically run within transactions. So there's a couple of different um, ways that uh, we can run T SQL T assertions. I did the test do what we think it could. And one of the ones that uh, I use quite a fair bit is equaling string, because normally I will be doing a unit test around a stored proc, and I want to make sure that what I expect to be there is there. Um, yeah, uh, it provides a number of assertion uh, stored procedures that we can use. Um, it also allows us um, isolating dependencies, um, and so we can verify whether or not the expected conditions have occurred. And there is one nuance of T SQL T, and that is you have to have a space. So let's say I have a stored procedure, STP create new person. I have to have a space between test and something. When I first started using T-SQL-T, I couldn't work out why my tests were not running. It was because I didn't have a space between them. So at this point, I'm going to see if I can connect to my VMs. Um, unfortunately, uh, my VMs are not responding. Um, Warwick, are you there? So what I may have to do um, is the Wi-Fi that I'm using won't allow me to get to the VM. I'm going to try and use my phone. Um, I may drop off and... And there we go, people. It looks like uh, Hamish dropped out while he swaps his 
uh, internet connectivity, the joys of live demos. Just a reminder to everybody while we are waiting for Hamish to come back, so we may run a couple of minutes late, but just a reminder to everybody that this session is being recorded and will be made available on the DBA Fundamentals uh, Archive website so that you are able to uh, come back and re-watch this session at any point in time. Also, another reminder to everybody on the call that uh, feel free to ask any questions at any point in time. I am monitoring those questions and I will put those through to Hamish at the end of the session. Looks like we do have Hamish back and he is going to show us his password. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> oh goodness um apologies for that um i'm actually at a client site that client does financial um things and uh yeah they're um their setup is fairly secure so what i might do um i just have to set up a few things so i will not have that one Oh, apologies. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. What I'll do is I just need two minutes work um, to set things up. So hopefully in my demo, I'm going to take you from this to this. Yeah, to this. Right. Uh, I just need one minute um, to start things up. And apologies. Um, I wasn't sure if it was my access, um, but what I will do, um, I just, actually I only need 20 more seconds. So um, I'll show you, I'll take you through um, what we're going to do. Okay, well the good news is, at least the VM has started. Okay. Uh, Warwick, can you see my uh, VM? Yes. Uh, Log into Team City. Yep, fantastic. So, Team City is a continuous integration uh, tool. It's, it does builds and um, automated testing. Um, I'm also going to use Octopus Deploy. Uh, this does. Um, uh, deployment so it does uh, the continuous delivery side so we see a whole heap of environments here um, and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use the simple talk um, system so we'll just make it a little bit more simpler and what it does is it has a database build don't worry about web apps. Who cares about web apps? Uh, and it has um, web app and database deploy. Now, unfortunately, you're going to see me sabotage my own system, but that's okay. <laughs> um, because the whole point of this is um, showing you when things go wrong and why they do go wrong. Uh. Actually, um, uh, the database that we're going to use here is the development one uh, that a person, Grant Fritchie, uses. And I'm going to borrow it for a while. And what I'll do is off screen, uh, make the change so that you don't know what I've changed. Because uh, that's the whole point of a demo. Um, the unknowns associated with it. <laughs> For those of you at home, please do not try this in production. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, and look, I have a funny story while I'm doing it. The particular thing I'm doing um, actually happened at a client site that I was at where a developer had uh, misunderstood um, what was required for a stored proc. They developed it. It worked swimmingly for a while until something came along to use that stored proc and uh <laughs> all hell broke loose because guess where they found it they found it in prod they did not find it in their dev system so what i'm going to do is actually um because i do have enough time uh which is a good thing 
I'm going to take us through a very, very simple demo using T SQL T, and then I'm going to show you how we can fold this into um, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So what I'm going to do is create the world's simplest database, a database called YIP. And it's going to have um, a couple of tables in it. And I'll show you them in a sec. Here we have our database YIP, and it's got two tables. Uh, an audit log table and a person table. And so what we want to do, um, we're going to add uh, T SQL T to this. Now T SQL T, all you do is download it and what you have is um, a framework that you add to your system. And so what I'm going to do is uh, add T SQL T to our system. Part of it is we need to um, put in, we need to turn CLR on, which is all good. And we also need to um, make the database trustworthy, which is all good. It's not the um, biggest change in the world. Again, we would only be doing this in our development system. And what we would do is as we are deploying out to, say, our build system and then through to, say, functional test, et cetera, we would be wanting to uh, strip out the T SQL T aspects. Now, T SQL T, after I've downloaded it, is just a script that I run in my database. And I cannot get to the top, but that's okay. Just bear with me. Right, here we go. So this is just uh, a bunch of scripts that I download as part of the framework. I run it against my database. Don't worry about this, it's gonna do some deletes. And all I do is run the script. It's now installed T SQL T on within my system. So if I refresh, I now have a whole heap of tables and a whole heap of stored procs associated with T SQL T. Now this looks a bit noisy. But that's okay because again, in my dev system, I don't care about all this. I'm again going to strip it out as we go closer to our prod system. So what I'm now gonna do is the meat of the demo. And all I'm going to do is create a stored proc. Pretty simple one, create new person. For now, that's not very much at all because the meat of what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new class. And this class is going to have all my mocked objects in it. So I'm going to create a test class called SP create new person. Boom. Now what that does is down in my stored procs, is I have my stored proc here that I just created. And you'll see here we have fake tables and we have all the um, all the uh, T SQL T um, stored procs that we can make use of. So what I'm going to do is create a procedure that is mocking up what I want to do. And you'll see here, 
that it adheres to the assemble, act, and assert phases of unit testing. So in our assemble, what we're going to do is, and I'll just make, move this over so you can see. Our test is check that an entry to the audit log table is made with the correct first and last name. And so we declare Envachar, so created user with first name Hamish, last name Watson. We exec the fake table, so we're going to create a fake table, a person, an audit log, i.e. the same as what we have. We then do the act. We execute the proc with first name Hamish, last name Watson, and then we select the top um, from audit log because this is an empty table because it's our fake table, and then we do the assert. We check whether or not what we expect is, spec is expected. So I'll now run this, which will then create my stored proc here, right there. So I always name my stored proc with a meaningful name that means something to me. So now what I can do is actually run the test, because this is test-driven development, right? So I want to run the test. And of course, the test fails because we have null. So now what I do is create the rest of our stored proc because the whole point of this proc is understanding the use case where we want to insert into person and audit log with that. So we're now running, we're now writing enough code to satisfy the test. So will the test run? No, of course it won't, because I wanted to fail the test first. I wanted to find out what would happen if something bad happened. And as you can see here, it failed. Created user was ham and what? And the problem is, is that when I created the stored proc, I had a three instead of three zero, three instead of three zero. So now I write enough code to pass the test. Will it pass the test? Hopefully. Boom, it did. So that, in a nutshell, is how we, um, we start our journey on test-driven development. And the key point here is understanding what it is that we're writing the code for. It's about understanding the use case. And so for my use case, it was inserting data in the audit log as we inserted a user into the person table. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this system here, which is linked up to source control. And what I wanna do is I'm going to make a change to the system and then <laughs> uh, <laughs> the tools are far more intelligent than me. So I'm going to commit this change, which is going to commit it to source control. I'm then going to push it up to um, my build server. And if I come over here, what we have is Team City, and it's actively polling source control, looking for changes as they come in. And I've made a change, and it's recognized the change, uh, and I've pushed it up because I'm that developer, because I think that I am just so good that I don't need to run unit tests or anything locally. Unit tests in a database? No, nah, it's not possible, mate. So I'm just going to continue on with my job. I needed to create some table. So I'm going to create the table um, if I refresh this. Cool, DBA fundamentals table. I'm done and dusted um, because I am, a you know, the world's best developer. Um, yep. What um, SQL source control notices here is that there is a change and, you know, um, edit a table. Yep, sweet as. Right, so again, 
I'm going to commit this up to source control. Uh, I won't do the push just yet because I want to see. Um, oh, look. Now, this here is the code that I pushed before. And this is uh, the CI process noticing that there is a change in source control and it's now pushing. Uh, it's, it's, it's grabbing the code, it's now running um, the builds and whatever, and hopefully, you know, it should just pass the test, whatever. What um, this system has, and I'll just show you here, you'll notice here that it has the T SQL T framework because I've already had that installed. Um, and it's got, you know, a couple of... Um, stored procs, a couple of tests associated with them. And in fact, what I could do is, I will actually run a um, uh, run SQL test. Now SQL test is um, built on top of T SQL T. So, oh yeah, I've got a unit test here. Yeah, I'll run it, I, it'll be fine. Oh. <laughs> Surprise, surprise, it's not. And in fact, uh, in this um, in this uh, unit test, it does again, and if I go to edit, you'll see that what Redgate have done is just put a wrapper around it. So, in, you know, we have the same thing, we create the fake table, and what it's doing is using the stored proc, add contact, and then verifying, I the assert, to see if it matches this. And lo and behold, it didn't. Uh, I know why. It's probably someone else's problem, not mine. And look at this, CI, our build process has failed too because I didn't run the unit test on my machine. And lo and behold, proc add contact, it expected that, but all it got was that. Oh, yeah. I think I know what that was. Yeah. So again, this is a trivial um, demo, but that's the whole point of demos, right? So I fixed this up. Okay, my code wasn't that elegant on the day. Probably the phone rung or something. Why don't I adhere to best practices and run the test locally? Hey, it succeeded. So now what I can do is... Um, yeah, I did my job right. So I'm going to commit this as well to source control, and then I'll do a push up to um, the build server. Cool. Now, I already know that this should pass, right, because I practiced this demo <laughs> earlier on this morning. So rather than everyone just watching this go through the process again, this will succeed and then it will go through and it will start deploying in our simple talk system here, it will deploy through and we can carry on as normal as you'd expect. Oh, and look, here's my, um, my commit that's uh, gone up. So what I might do is uh, carry on with the uh, oh, what I will just say before I finish here, and in fact, I've lost my mouse. Yep, there we go. Um, if everything works uh, in our continuous integration system, it's going to push to uh, the integration environment here. And uh, the way we'll know if it did, because it will have this horrendously horribly named table down in here. But for now, what I'll do is continue on with my presentation and we'll come back. So the demo agenda was we looked at some simple testing. We looked at T-SQL T. It's great because it's written in T-SQL, right? Um, we didn't look at SSDT um, and we started to bring things together in continuous integration. Some of the lessons learned. Look, remember that unit tests are small, um, as should your change be. So our, our unit tests are not big tests. There's no if-then branching in our unit tests. We want to keep the test simple because we're doing the smallest amount of change. We write a unit test, it's simple. And the tests are independent. I don't have to rely on another test for my test to complete.
And once we have tests running, we combine them into continuous integration. And then obviously we start pushing that out into continuous delivery, deploying out to production. There's some really great T-SQL T references out there. And um, David Green um, is the author of this plural site course here, and he's written a whole heap of information on T-SQL T, and I've used his blog so many times. Um, and Greg Lucas has also written a lot about T-SQL T. And if you're doing, um, if you want to do T-SQL T testing, i.e. unit testing across database tables, this particular um, blog site here is invaluable. Some best practices. Um, tests should be run often. I every commit, do the tests. Um, long <laughs> running tests will kill the enjoyment of this. Try and keep your tests small, succinct. What we'll do is bring our unit tests into integration tests that we will run overnight and keep our test key code cleaner than our production code. It's actually as important as our production code. And tests are living. They need to maintain, be maintained. By this stage, I have to admit one thing. Whether or not you agree with test-driven development, I don't actually care. I really don't. But what I do care about is writing tests, please. If you want to write your unit tests after you've written the code, so be it. I don't, I'm not going to um, sit on my high horse and say, oh, that's the wrong way to do it. If you just write tests, that's at least a start. A bad way to deliver change to your database is not to do automated testing. So there's no point just having heaps of manual tests because humans, we're kind of inconsistent, but automation will help us. Start unit testing, functional testing, your database code and data, please. Again, I, I've said please a couple of times here. The reason being is I want people to make their systems better. I want your deploys to production to be the most boring thing known to man because it works every time. At this stage, uh, I welcome some questions. Um, the person in this picture is a tester who taught me everything about unit testing and in fact helped me embrace DevOps uh, for the database. And so as a thank you to him for showing me the light, I always have him on the question slide. Um, what I will do at this stage is just see how um, our change went. Oh, look at this, success. So our test passed. What happened to, oh, we have a, deploy that succeeded. Do we have a table? Hooray, we have a table. So that in a nutshell is why test-driven development is fantastic and will make a positive change for you. Look, thank you so much for um, seeing my session. I apologize the internet being a little bit too tight using my client's Wi-Fi. I had to use my phone. These are my details. If you want to reach out via email, I love answering people's questions. I'm on Twitter. I have a blog. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Okay. Thanks. So, Hamish, the first question that has come through, what all deployments can lead to impact the service? So, oh, sorry, you dropped out there, mate. What, okay. Did you repeat the question? Yeah. So what type of deployments can lead to yes. impact the service in production? Bad ones. <laughs> what type of, what was that first sentence? What, what type of deployments? Yep. So we're oh, making change. Yes. So, so the whole the whole session yes. is around test driven development. Yep. So type of deployment could lead to impact the service. Um, well, deployments that don't have any tests in them, um, that's certainly going to have an impact because you're putting all your faith that when your change hits production, that everything's fine. That's that's not a good deployment. I want deployments that have unit tests written by developers. I want automated tests run by my build server. I want functional tests along the way, and I want all those to be automated. That means that when we do hit the service or production, that the impact 
is a positive one because it works. Any failures, we'll find out when it doesn't matter to the client. We'll find out on small systems, we'll remediate it, and then we'll do the automated deploys again. Okay. Now you're talking about uh, T SQL T and having all of those tables and scripts added to your non production environment or your development environment. How difficult is it to, as you mentioned, strip those out so that they don't end up oh. in our later environment? <laughs> ah, that's a fantastic question. And in fact, um, <laughs> depending on um, how much time I have, uh, I actually do that. But let me answer it really quickly. Um, it is literally tsql t dash uninstall. And so in my build step, and in fact, we had that here, um, before we deployed to the integration environment here, we stripped out in our build process all of these tables. Yeah, it's tsql t dash uninstall. And it just rips it out. And then we just deploy and carry on because we know our test passed. Okay. Uh, uh, can you see the T-SQL T um, website? Yes. Hopefully. Yeah, cool. Yes. Okay. So in my environment, we observe that there are a few performance issues observed after the deployments. So I guess uh, we might need a little bit more information around that. So I guess the question in I guess it's more of a statement that we're putting something through to our production environment and afterwards we are seeing some <laughs> performance issues. How could we maybe prevent that? Fantastic. Um, part of the um, testing that you'll, you'll do, you won't just do like, you know, unit test, integration test. I want to do performance tests. And generally, I will do those right up, say, a pre-prod or a staging environment right before I hit prod. And we'll have some automated stress test tools, and there's a whole heap of them out there that you can use. And in fact, I'm working with a client. They had the same situation. They deployed some new code, hit the database, and suddenly it wasn't performing as they expected. And... <laughs> They implemented a performance stress test environment, ran it there, saw the um, saw the effect of it, remediated, and then the next deploy of you know massive code had the desired effect in prod. You definitely have to do stress testing. Test driven development won't um, make that much better because it's hard to stress test on your laptop, but as part of continuous delivery processes you definitely need to stress test along the way. And as, as as soon as you can, it doesn't have to be right before prod, you may be very lucky to have the infrastructure where you can spin up an environment. You know, it might be two deploys into your deploy pipeline. You have a stress test environment. That would be fantastic. And in fact, it would be awesome if your build environment was your stress test environment. But, you know, I live in the real world. I know that resource is hard to get. But try and have a stress test performance environment somewhere along the line so that you find it out before it hits prod. Okay. Do we have any other questions given that uh, we've gone over a tiny bit, but that's okay. If we don't have any more questions, then I would like to say... Uh, thank you to Hamish for coming along and presenting this month to us. I'd like to say thank you to all of the attendees who have come along once again to DBA Fundamentals Down Under. And I look forward to seeing you all once again, uh, second Tuesday of the month in May, where we will have Rob Farley talking to us. So with, our, with that, thank you. And I look forward to hosting you all again next month. Cheers.